Hello, uh, thanks very much. It's an absolute honour to present to all of you today. Uh, as was said, I'm Sam. I sound funny because I come from New Zealand, um, like Lord of the Rings and stuff. Um, yeah, so I've been making apps for about six years now, since my second to last year of high school. Uh, but on a daily basis, I now kind of write an iOS SDK. I work with Fortune 500 companies, helping them set up Push. And I'm kind of borderline getting obsessed with Push and making it and getting it, getting it right. Because um, as I'm about to explain, it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky. So today I want to cover, oh, turn this on. Today I want to cover uh, three topics. Uh, conceptual overviews of, use, of using notifications, uh, how to implement and debug notifications, and finally I want to finish off with best practices for notifications. Um, I thought of this talk before WWDC came out, so I've, I've shoehorned in the iOS 10 changes as well, of which there are a lot. Uh, I want to try to add a bit more value to the talk than a usual WWDC talk by kind of diving deep into some weird stuff I've discovered and hopefully adding a bit more value. So let's get into it. So first of all, uh, let's talk about notification concepts. So what are user notifications? There are two types of notification. There are local notifications and remote notifications. These both require permission from the user and they both present in the same way. Generally, to a user, it's visually indistinguishable whether or not the, user, uh, the notification is a remote one or a local one. So local notifications are scheduled in code, and they're, they have to be thought, out, thought about ahead of time, and their structure is thought about, and even sometimes their content is thought about. They can be triggered by time, either by time interval, so like every day, every week, every month, or they can happen at a calendar event, so someone's birthday, you know, when you're going to leave, that sort of stuff. There's also location-based triggers. So location-based triggers happen with CL circular regions, and as a person enters a region for a certain amount of time with a certain uh, kind of like penetration amount, uh, both undocumented, a notification will fire and you can react to that. Remote notifications, these are the fun ones. So these are also called push notifications, and generally I call everything notification-related push notifications, even though I sometimes might mean local. Um, they are sent from, by a server at a given time that you know, makes sense, and then uh, the operating system processes it and displays it to the user. So what do they look like? Um, I've used a screenshot from iOS 10, in case you haven't seen it. They look a little bit different. Um, so they come up like this now, and we have an alert badge and sound. You all have received a notification at some point? Yes, hands up. Awesome, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, optionally you have a sound and a badge as well, uh, but typically if you have an alert, you get an alert. Uh, so I'm going to mainly talk about iOS today, uh, but push notifications, remote notifications, user notifications, work on other platforms too. So on iOS we have the alert badge sound, on iOS 10 or Mac OS as we have to start trying to remember to say now, is alert badge and sound. Uh, TV OS for things like unread count or unwatched count, you can start to badge your apps. Uh, for watch OS you can do alert and sounds as well, and even buttons. Uh, CarPlay, which took a while to find out the answer to this one, you can actually play sounds over the playing audio. So if you're listening to uh, Kelly Ray Jepsen, uh, you know, an incoming phone call can actually play over that. And Safari, you can also set alerts and you can also customise buttons. So, what can you actually do with these notifications? Let's talk about the alert text. So, you can send localizable text down to the phone. Uh, there's no really hard limit for the length of the string, um, but generally you have about five to ten words, and the operating system will just truncate it, and the user might be left confused. Um, it's got to fit on the screen, and there can be a title and a subtitle where the title is, so that's the title of their meeting, and then there's the subtitle or the body of the text. Um, this makes sense, so this is the app name, this is who the mail's from, and this is the start of the message. Uh, if you have translations or localizations, you can send these down. So if you have like game request and you have a localization in your strings file, it'll bring that up and it'll work. You can even send down parameters to this. So X challenged Y in a game, uh, that'll translate automatically. It's quite cool. Uh, badge. So you can set a badge, which looks like this. Um, you can have anywhere from one to int max digits long, um, but don't. Uh, you want to go up to about 10,000, 100,000 at most. Um, and if you set the badge to zero, uh, it'll 
dismiss all the all the alerts for that particular app. Uh, you can also not have you can't also can't have negative numbers, so you can't have negative one messages read or anything silly like that. Sounds so uh, these have to be included in the app bundle, and they're usually a .wav CAF or AIF file. They have to be less than 30 seconds, otherwise the operating system will play the default sound. So if you've gone and written a three minute song to welcome the user to the app, it's not going to play. Um, and you can use AF convert on the, on the command line to convert your sounds and that sort of stuff. You can also download open source sounds and free use sounds and whatnot. Um, but they must be included in the app bundle. You can't just send a string of a, of a file name and expect it to work. Now, iOS 8 brought the concept of actions. So actions are basically buttons. Um, so actions are defined by you, the developer, and they're configured when you go, to go ahead and register for the notification. And I'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, actions fall into what are called categories, but I would like to call them scenarios. So this, for example, is the scenario of a new email and it has things like mark is read and trash. You might have a scenario like a calendar invite, or a calendar reminder, or a new tweet, or a new favorite, and these all will trigger different actions. So you have your categories, and then multiple actions go into a category, and you have multiple categories, and that goes into what you want to do with push. Um, and then as the user taps the buttons, it kicks off a delegate method inside your app, and you can handle it. It's pretty cool. Um, so you can also configure what the actions do, um, and largely it'll make sense when you get to the API. So you can do things like either it'll run some code in the background of your app and not have to launch the app, it might, may require the user to put in their pin or use Touch ID to authenticate um, something. So say if you are using TweetBot and a new tweet comes in, you can like it without having to authenticate, but you can only reply if you've authenticated. So if I go t around to your uh, phone, sir, and look up your notifications, I can't really wreak havoc without having your fingerprint. Um, you also get to define how many actions you want to display in certain modes. So in this example here, we've got two buttons, but in this full mode, we've got four buttons. So you define a minimal set of buttons, and you define a default set of buttons. Um, and obviously, you want the most important ones as the first two. You can also have what's called a destructive action. So if you're going to delete something, which is not shown in the screenshot for some reason, um, or do some sort of permanent write, um, it'll show red. So you would have seen that with various apps. So it'll show up red. Cool. Um, we also have text input. So iOS 9 brought us text input, and it looks like this. Um, and it allows a user to input text in response to a notification. So it's a it's so basically a subclass or a type of action, and when the user finished typing and press send, it gets delivered to your app, and your app is meant to handle it. Um, Facebook app does this terribly. If anyone's used that, it works like 10% of the time. It's so frustrating. Um, in iOS 10, this changed a little bit. Uh, so this, this text box, you can now define accessories on, and you can add additional buttons. It's quite fun. Um, speaking of iOS 10, as I said earlier, there was a bunch of iOS 10 changes. So uh, I was pretty happy with this feature set, but Apple thought, let's redo the whole API. So iOS 10 brings with a completely new, completely revamped API, um, and also gave us two new app extensions. So let's talk about the rev revamped UI. So Apple replaced all the wonderfully named UI user notification star classes with just UN classes, so UN for user notifications. Um, overall, the same concepts are there, categories, actions, inputs, that sort of stuff, um, alerts, badge, sounds. But now the API is a bit more sensible, and it's a bit more robust, and it's a really nice API to use if you've not kind of dug into an Apple API before because of how nicely it lines up to the UI you've seen as an iOS user. So you know what destructive input looks like, you know why authentication is there, you know how it app how it works when it opens your app or closes your app. You know what a badge looks like or what a sound sounds like. So it makes sense. Um, the old API is, of course, deprecated, so you can still use it, but you should move when you get the chance. So notable improvement in the API, um, you can now manage the remote notifications. So previously, you were only able to manage notifications that scheduled locally. 
Um, so you're able to get back an array of these notification objects, delete them, update them, change their properties. Now you can do that with remote notifications, which is super cool. Previously, what, all you could do was clear them by sending the badge to zero, um, and you didn't really have much else uh, to do. Some workarounds that developers did was actually send a silent push and then trigger a local, and then you could do things like collapsing and, and deletion as you required. Um, but now it's coming natively in iOS 10, which is quite cool. The next thing you can do is actually inspect the responses from these buttons and these inputs. So if your user dismisses your uh, notification, you'll actually get a callback saying they didn't care. Sorry. Um, which is a really interesting analytic to collect um, if you're able to do so. So it means you can start to improve over time uh, what text works with what people. You can start A-B testing it. You can do A-B auto winner stuff like that. It's, it's quite cool. Um, and the other cool new thing is the ability to control the foreground appearance. So typically by default, uh, if you're inside the app and a notification comes in, there's no UI. You're inside the app already. The whole point of notification is to get you back into the app. But now in iOS 10, you can actually define, say, hey, I want a pop-up banner, I want an alert, I want some sort of UI to happen when this notification comes in. And therefore, you're able to interrupt the experience of the user while they're on, like while they're inside the app, and you, you better have a good reason, and they are able to carry out the action you want them to carry out. Cool. Um, they gave us a new app extensions as well. So the first one they gave us is called a notification service extension, and this is called before the alert is shown to the user. So it's a great time to maximize the value of the content you have for your user. So you might want to add a thumbnail and like have a little thumbnail there. You might want to start downloading content in the background ready for the app state to be ready. Um, you might want to decrypt the content if you've gone to the lengths of encrypting it on the way to the phone. Um, or you might want to even reach to a server and update the content. So say if you're doing sports scores and you send a push out, uh, you know, in the time you've sent that out, someone might have scored a, a try or a goal, and it's, it's worth double-checking that. And you can also keep it updated with the same extension. So that's before the alert, and then once you have the alert, you can do some cool stuff with it. So notification content extensions lets you create your own UI. Uh, you have a full storyboard at your disposal. However, it's not interactive, um, sort of like today widgets to a point. Um, and you're able to create your own rich UI. You're able to do things like auto layout and have as many UI elements as you want that are not touchable. And like the example here with the calendar is that like just the text of the message alone saying you've got an invite for Taco Tuesday, that doesn't tell the user much. But put it inside the context of you know, their day already and you know, the interviews in the afternoon, the bake sale in the morning, that sort of adds more information without actually like it just gives them more context. So it's a really good user experience thing, and you should be working with your designers to think about how you can format your data in a more readable way and one that fits within the context of how the user uses the app. So classic, it depends. Um, if you want to learn more about iOS 10, I suggest you go watch the sessions. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them here because that would be boring and redundant. Um, and if you've got any questions, you can hit me up afterwards. Any questions so far? Cool, so that's a conceptual overview of user notifications. Moving on to implementation and debugging. So who here has set up push before for all their app? Cool, keep your hand up if it was super easy and everything went right. Cool, so no hands up. Uh, there's a half a hand over there. <laughs> um, it's tricky, it's absolutely tricky. There are a lot of steps, a lot of places you can go wrong, and yeah, I work with lots, lots of our clients every day to sort of help them through the process again and try to find, find out where they went wrong. And there's always something different. It's, it's quite an enlightening experience. Um, so the first part of any push notification is setting up the, the, the server side. So setting up remote push has a few steps. Uh, first of all, you need to create or edit your app ID to allow push notifications and set that up. Uh, you then need to upload certificates. You then need to generate a new provisioning profile. You need to configure, build, and run. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. So this is abbreviated, so let's go a bit slowly. So you have your developer portal. Um, uh, if you let Xco manage this, then you're a damn fool, and I don't want you to do that. So go into here, do it manually, it always works, and then you want to go ahead and click on push notifications and start setting it up. So you'll get to this screen, and you want to go and create a certificate. 
and you get to do something cool, which is request a certificate from a certificate authority, which is really a nice way of saying to fill in some fields and save it. Um, it really sounds really fancy. So this is keychain access. You'll find it on your Mac if you've not used it before. Uh, you just go to the keychain access menu, click create assistant, and you're, you're good. Certificate assistant, and you're good. Uh, you'll get to this thing. You can type whatever you really want in here, and then save it to disk. Uh, but you're, you're best to use an email and a name representative of your company. Uh, but make sure you save it to disk. <laughs> if you've forgotten all that, the instructions are there again for you. You'll still get confused, don't worry. Um, so upload the certificate request file, and you're good to go, and you'll get back to the screen. Now you have a download button, and you can download the certificate. <laughs> you're not done yet. Um, at this point, you'd want to follow the instructions from the push provider you're using to, in order to upload to that platform. So typically, you'd get this certificate, download it back into Keychain Access, and export it in a slightly different format with an optional password, and then upload it to that service. This is the product I work on. It's called Carnival. And we just let our users drag it in, and we prefer them not to use a password, and fewer things go wrong. We also do, and most services do, additional validation to match things like bundle IDs and that sort of stuff to make sure you've got it right. We also check that you've put uh, the development gateway and the development one, the production gateway and the production one. So here's a rough diagram, very terribly drawn by me, um, showing how pushes get there. So the push server, your server, another company's server, will talk to Apple, the Apple push notification service, with the certificate, they'll go, hello, I'm talking on behalf of this person, and Apple will go, what up? What do you want? And then you'll go, hey, I've got these tokens and I've got this content. And they'll go, cool, we'll sort that out for you. And then Apple will be like, hey, devices, have at it. And then the push will appear. Uh, Apple keeps a persistent connection with your device after you power it on. There's a constant socket connection. And we'll get to that later on. It's quite cool. So uh, that's server side. Now client side. So you have to register for push. So you register what's called a settings object, and it's changed in iOS 10. But in the settings object, you specify if you want to lurch badges or sounds. You can uh, register for a subset of those as well. And then you have your categories, which are collections of actions. And then you optionally also uh, register for remote notifications. Uh, so once that's done, you should get a token. So, but as soon as you say register for user notifications, you'll then get an alert saying to the user, do you want to accept push notifications? And I'll talk about when a good time to do that is later on. It's, it's certainly not um, in app to finish launching. Uh, so registering for push, this is what it looks like in the code. Um, so I've put no categories here for simplicity, but this is it in Swift with the iOS 9 API. And in iOS 10, it's changed ever so slightly. They've moved a lot of the code out of the UI application class and into its own UN notification center class, I believe. And it's just decluttered the UI application, which was getting a little bit fat. Um, you can have multiple categories. You can register the lot. You've just got to do it once. Uh, you can't add categories dynamically or anything like that, as far as I know. So uh, once you register for push, you should get, this is only remote pushes by the way, um, you should get one of these two callbacks. So you should get, all going well, did register for remote notifications with device token, which hands you out a little NS data object, which is basically a string. It's a 20-ish character hex string. And that's what we call the token. It's a unique identifier to that device, to that app, from Apple. Um, you'll always get a token, even if the user says, no, I don't want to allow push which is interesting. So it's not a good way to say, has the user allowed push? There's other API you can use to query that. Um, you'll always get a token. The times when you won't get a token is when, or the times when this one we call is when you're using the, the simulator. Simulators cannot register for push. Um, it'd be nice if they could, but they don't. And or when you've stuffed up the certificate process and the provisioning thing, and you'll get a, an error that will be useful if you log out the localized um, description. And it should tell you what you've done wrong. So once you've got that did receive token method, um, you generally hand it off to your server. Um, a lot of SDKs will swizzle that method and do it for you. And then this is the complete picture. So we hand the token up to the server, and now we have the tokens to do the push. And it just works in a nice circle. 
So you're up and running on your device, and notifications might work on the simulator, but they work on the device. And so like Game Center or in-app purchases, push notifications have the concept of a sandbox environment and a production environment. And your operating system will choose the environment based on which provisioning profile you've used and which uh, distribution profile you're using. So if you're using a development profile, you get the sandbox gateway. If you're using an ad hoc enterprise or app store profile, you'll get the production gateway. It's important to note that the tokens you get are either tokens for the production gateway or the development gateway. If you try to send to a device that has, it's registered with the development gateway with a production token, it won't work and vice versa. And Apple will provide feedback to the push service about that, about that failing. And they've recently read on the API, so that's actually a lot nicer now. So in code, once you've actually sent the push, you'll get one of these two methods. You'll get the one you've implemented uh, being called. And they only get called in some circumstances. So one of the gotchas here is these won't be called unless your app is in memory. And what I mean by in memory is I mean it's either been backgrounded or it's, it's been backgrounded. If you've swiped it out of memory, it's dead, it's not waking up. If you've recently rebooted your phone or iPad, it also won't get it. So this is why the, the idea of overriding this and then presenting a user notification is sometimes a bit flaky without more work. Uh, this method here lets you do some cooler stuff and that lets you do background fetch. So there's a completion handler on that method and you call that once you've done your work. So this is really good for preparing content ahead of the user You'll get roughly 30 seconds. It's an undocumented time. It's managed by the operating system, so it's affected by things like battery health, uh, whether or not you're in low power mode, how hungry your app is generally. If it's using GPS, it'll get less, all that junk. Um, and all you need to do is put in your APS, APNS payload, which I'll talk about more about later, is this flag called content available, which then forces the that method to be called, um, to set it to one, and you should be good to go. Cool. Any questions so far? Excellent, cool. So let's talk about um, how you as a developer can use tools and stuff to set up push um, and use it in development or even production. So when you Google Apple push notification GitHub, you get a bunch of repos. Here's some. Uh, we developed APNS2. We use it in-house at Carnival. It's written in Go and it has an amazing throughput because of the way Go is written and the fact that Go has an HTTP2 client in it. Um, another popular one is Houston or Houston, um, which is written in Ruby, and we also use that for our old stack and for some validation. And then there's also things like NW Pusher and Cuff, which will actually give you some Mac UI to drag in certificates and tokens and type in a box, and it's pretty cool for testing stuff. And there's also things for Node and other backing languages like Django and stuff. There's also commercial solutions, so you can just Google the best push notifications, and this, this company here has written a review on the best ones in the top of Google and uh, my company's at the top, which is nice. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, these are obviously free. Um, check it out, do it yourself. These ones you start to pay more and you get to decide how valuable push notifications are to you and how much you're willing to pay. So yeah. So who was using PARS before? Hands up. Cool. Is anyone kind of freaking out about what to change to? Because Sweet, yeah. So most people have moved to Firebase, but if you're really wanting to take push seriously, I look into some more proper commercial solutions and you'll get more support and more guidance. So uh, the server will send you something called an APNS payload, which is a JSON object, and it has a couple of fields. So the APS field is the main field for alert um, and alert and that sort of stuff, so it's that whole field. So for alert, you can set the title and the body, or you can just set a string if you just want to set the string, and it'll use the app name as the title. Badge, obviously, an integer. Uh, sound is the name of the sound file. Category is the unique identifier you gave the category as you was coding it, so the hard-coded value must match the one in your code. And of course, content available will wake up stuff ahead of time. There are some more keys I'm not listed here. And then you can also just whack in as much arbitrary content as you want, up to four kilobytes. So if you've got special IDs or things you need to build your request to the server to download more content, this is a great place to put it. You can whack as much as you want in there. That's super easy. Cool, so push is great when it works, uh, but it's not always smooth sailing. And so let's talk about how you'd go about 
actually debugging it. So some of the common pitfalls is people forget to regenerate the provisioning profile after modifying the app ID. And this is where Xcode is useful, I'll concede. It does this for you, um, but most people would just re-download and drag it back into Xcode and it should just pick it up. Uh, if you're using the wrong APNS gateway, so you get the wrong token, you push the wrong one, Apple will say, we don't know about that device, and you'll be like, what? And then also you might be tempted to use the fix issue button, just don't, um, just don't use that. That's not gonna fix your issue. It's, 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 it's actually, um, if you look in the translation for the fix issue thing, in other languages it actually says, make more issues for me. Um, so it's so weird that English came out like that. Um, so, as I said, Apple maintains this persistent connection with the phone. And every time APNS pushes something to your phone, uh, it logs it out. So we had this brilliant thing called the persistent connection config. And to get it, you visit TechNote2265, which I can link to um, on Twitter afterwards. And basically, you download this file, you host it on a server, or easier, you email it to yourself, you install it, you restart your phone, and then you've got very verbose logs about everything your phone's doing, and it's great. So, once you've got your phone plugged in, you've sent yourself some pushes after this is set up, you can sync with iTunes or open the devices log inside Xcode and inside the devices screen, and you'll start to see messages, as shown here. So connected to courier means I'm connected to the APNS, so this should happen once you change networks or boot your phone up. Uh, if your corporate network or school or university is blocking the port, which is a lot more often than you think, uh, it'll log out saying I'm not able to connect, which is sometimes we have to go in there and just double check that that's actually the case and then yell, out, yell at some uh, help desk people, which is fun. Um, you also get logs when the users actually just push, turned off push and they don't want to see any notifications at all uh, and you try to push to them. Uh, if the server's mucked up the JSON, you'll get a log about that as well and otherwise you'll just get the full-blown log for the push. So here's an example push to my test app. So we have an arbitrary piece of information called the notification ID. Um, this is the text, hold a high mark, and the content available. Some people snigger at that reference, I'm, good that, I'm glad that you got it. Um, it's a reference to the room, you should all see it. It's tragic and terrible. Don't, don't. don't. It's, it's, it's garbage, isn't it? Um, cool, so this is, so if you're confused about why things are not working, you can use this log file, and this is sort of the silver bullet um, to debugging stuff. Uh, another good way is actually just go retrace your steps. Uh, there are a lot of steps, retrace them, and the TechNote 2265 will actually give you a lot more detailed steps to, to troubleshoot as well. It's usually the developer misunderstanding how provisioning profiles work. So I really encourage you, if you don't have your head around them, go spend the two hours of reading about them properly and get your head around them and then keep doing that every time you're confused because otherwise you'll be pressing that fix issue button and not helping yourself. Cool, so that's uh, implementation and debugging. I wish you the, the best of luck because uh, it is a bit lucky sometimes. Um, but it's just a matter of slowing down, retracing your steps and checking the boxes and making sure you've done everything. Um, Obviously, I've done this hundreds of times now, and it's always fixable. It's always going to be able to work. You just need to slow down and focus. Cool. So let's talk about best practices. So this is a little less technical, um, but it's something that really starts to annoy me when I tell people I work for a push notification company because they say, oh, you work for a spam company. Well, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. But there's something else I want to talk about, and that is that notifications go to people not devices. I'll repeat that. Notifications go to people, not devices. And people have good times to be contacted, and they have times where they really don't want to hear from you. They have things where they care about what you have to say and things where they don't. They couldn't care less about what you're telling them. So this has always got to be something super important to them. Another shocking statistic I read yesterday, uh, the other day was 70% of app uninstalls are triggered by a push notification. So the great thing about push notifications is that they, it reminds you that you have the app installed. But the worst thing about push notifications is that it reminds you that you have the app installed. <laughs> so bad push practice can lead to uninstalls, which means less usage, less feedback, less revenue, and can really start to hurt your bottom line. So, best, so good push practice is really, really important. So let's start off with some tips. First of all, make them timely. And what I mean by this is try to predict the right time for the user. And can you be more flexible than just when you want to send the push? So respect to their time zone. Uh, not everyone lives in Australia, not everyone lives in New Zealand, not everyone lives in America, despite what people think. 
So it's maybe important to sort of consider where they are in the world, and you're able to collect information from the UI device class. Um, so let's say it's 5 p.m. here in Melbourne, and we want to send out a happy commute home, everyone. Uh, sending that now to all your users won't make sense, but if you stagger it over the 24-hour period as everyone comes to 5 p.m. in their day, uh, that'll work better. If you're downloading content off your server, you get the added bonus of not crashing your server, as your users are waking up in 20-something times, uh, the server's being hit 20-something times with 20-something time zones, uh, which is quite cool. And any decent push service should give you this option to specify a time and just have it delivered in the right time zone. Um, respect sleepy time. So people like to go to sleep at night, that's cool. Some developers don't, that's also cool. What you do, you. Um, but consider this, say if you get up in the morning and you look at all your notifications, more often than not, I bet most of you just hit clear and the 30 or so notifications will go away. So if your notifications are there in the morning, they're not going to get as much attention as they are when the user's awake or even up and about. Um, so we're not talking about you know, like alerts and sounds. Most people put their phone on silent. But just getting in the queue of backlog, which most people feel not guilty about clearing, uh, that can hurt you. So maybe you might want to hold the messages off if you know that person's asleep, roughly 10 to 8 a.m., uh, and then send it two hours after they wake up. Maybe a summary, like, you know, 27 people liked your Instagram photo, tap here to see who they were. Might work. Sometimes you might want to send multiple pushes to a person for multiple reasons, and they will interact with your app for different reasons. So you need to have a way to say, this user's received enough push, push notifications from us today. Uh, we've contacted them 20 times, none of them are urgent. Maybe we should have a back off. So you want to respect back off times, and ultimately you want to let your users decide this. So expose some settings for them to decide it. Uh, then you'll also need to decide a priority based on what notifications are more important. So that sort of stuff. Respect the back off time. Don't try to annoy them more than once a day or more than five to ten times a day or whenever what makes sense for your app. If it's a chat app, fine, go nuts. I'm expecting to see it. But if it's ten sale notifications a day, I don't want to see it. Next up, keep your pushes relevant. So you really want to personalize based on the user's journey. So these, the most valuable pushes are the ones that are for me. Um, if you have information about your user, um, any sort of demographic information, any sort of purchase information, or what level of the game they're on, or like what they've done with their account, this can start to group users into groups which you can send notifications to under an assumption, and you're able to get a better response because it's actually for them. So it's, it's quite nice to be able to use this sort of automation and engagement tools to sort of get a better response, and this is what kind of the stuff I work on does. Um, and it's really cool to get some of the basic stuff off the ground. Personalize with names. So if you, if you have the name, don't try to derive it or find it, um, you can get a push notification. So I can say, Sam, check out these new Doctor, Hoy, Doctor Who toys. Tap here. Um, oh, and for God's sake, don't say click here, because we don't click on phones. I see that too often, it's annoying. Um, alternatively, but not mutually exclusively with personalized push, is transactional push. Um, so these are the one-to-one -one pushes, and these are by definition personalized. So, but they also adhere to things like time zone support. Lastly, you want to, uh, nextly, you want to use precise language. You have about five to ten words, use them wisely. Five to ten words, use them wisely. Uh, being a good citizen, wrapping up, uh, ask for permission carefully. So don't do an app to finish launching. Put up a screen saying, hey, we want to send you pushes. Here's the benefit to you, you as a user to enable pushes. If you don't have a benefit, don't ask for push. If they say, okay, I want to set pushes, then start the registration process. We've seen opt-in go from 20 to 30% up to about 70 to 90% with just this one simple trick. Um, this also applies to other things like, can I get your location or Bluetooth, please? As I've talked about, preload your content. You have the time. Please make it so that I can open your app and the UI loads almost instantly because the content's there. Consider downloading the HTML as any starter and then in it your web view with that, or just have the data ready to go. Represent your notifications inside your app. It's really easy to clear it, especially in the morning, so please have like an activity screen or a notification screen and where I can go and reread those alerts again. Tweetbot does this really well, they have an activity screen, we can go and reread that stuff again, so who favorited, who liked, that sort of stuff. Expose settings. So Swarm does this super well and you can expose settings for what type of things you want to hear about, and just put more power in the user's hands. And it's really important uh, to, to do this. You can also tell if a user's denied push. If they have, remind them of the benefit, and then you can deep link them to the settings app 
and going to turn back on again. Use a third-party push provider. Don't, oh, do it at your own risk, really. Um, I might be biased saying this. We, here, we deal with scaling, we deal with reliability, we deal with the feedback for you, and you can focus on making a great app. If you have any more, I would like to write a Medium post after this conference, so please tweet me. I'm at Sam Jarman. Um, so, so far today, we've talked about this, and I've been Sam Jarman. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned the quote about uh, the stat about uh, app installs being correlated to push notifications. Yeah. Where do you get the stat on having collected a stat of uninstalled? Uh, I saw the stat secondhand, and I tried to get the original source. Okay. But I, I do know it's valid. But it's, it's got to do with, a. I imagine, I don't know exactly, but I imagine they're tracking the event of a did receive push, and then a, no more events after that. So that's you know, a fair guess, I guess okay. you could say. Any other questions? Yes. So, um, I think you're most helpful to explain the now as in the Android store. So, I have a pretty good use by putting one of them to other applications in the app. For example, any browser in Google. How do you do that? Do you to create any browser connection? Yeah, so the question was how do you send a push notification to 10,000 people? So, with the new um, server, and I'm yeah, so with the new server, uh, with the new AP, APNS service, uh, you open up assistant connection, and then you make multiple requests over HTTP2. So HTTP2 lets you open a connection and then do multiple requests with that one TCP IP connection, which is the one that takes your time to establish with the authentication and whatnot. And then for every, you say, like, I want to make a post, and then the, the URL, you have the token, and the content is the body, and then the response is whether or not the notification was successfully delivered. So you, you basically need a massively scaling server, and that's why I recommend using a third party, because they have hundreds of machines with heaps of persistence connections. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much.